Welcome back. This web development project is going to be great if you're looking to add something a bit different to your portfolio because we're going to take an idea which is beginner level and make it much, much more complicated. Well, to say more complicated, you could say it's improved and done in such a way that elevates it from beginner level and would be more how a professional web developer may approach it. So as the title of this video suggests, we'll be creating a JavaScript group quote app a simple front-end web page that grabs a random quote, possibly from an array of objects or a third-party API, and then updates the web page with the quote details. This is the kind of project you'll see in a lot of online curriculums, such as free code camps. But what makes this project we're going to make different is we're going to make our quote app more flexible than just picking a quote from an array by enabling it to take a quote from one of multiple data sources to which you, the developer, can customize. We'll even provide a fallback if there are any errors fetching quotes from an API, so the quote app will always be able to give the user a quote even if all the third-party APIs are offline. I know you're going to learn a lot from completing this project and it will help to elevate your thinking about how you approach beginner-level projects. So let's get started. The first step is to create the markup in our web page, which will be used to display the quote to the user. We've already got a directory set up with an index.html, app.css, and quote app.js file, and of course our markup will live in our HTML file. Just to note, I've included a CDN link to the Font Awesome Icons library as we'll be using a couple of these for our buttons. Let's add our markup to give us a basic document structure. It's pretty straightforward. We have a main element for our page that has two sections. The first section is to hold all of the elements that will be used to display the quote to the user, the source the quote came from, the author of the quote, and of course the quote text itself, which will be displayed in the block quote element. So we can set up some styles and test how our quotes will look. We've added some sample quote text to the elements, but we'll be replacing this with JavaScript once we've got our quotes being generated. The second section contains the buttons that can be used to either generate a new quote on the page or share it to various social media platforms. Before we get cracking with the JavaScript for our quote generator app, let's add some styles for the markup we just added. First, we'll set a font for the document body and push all the content in for rems. Then for the section where the quote content lives, we'll set a background color, some margin on the left and right, and push the content of this section into the center by two rems with the padding property. Then to finish off this section, we'll add a few specific rules for the different parts of the quote. This is simply a case of removing the margin on the block quote element as it has an initial margin left property which will make it out of line with the other elements. We'll put the author text on the right hand side with the text align property and the source element has a smaller font size and the text will be set in italics. The only other section we created in our market was the imaginatively named button section. Let's add the styles for this section and then we'll be mostly done with the styling of our quote app. Here we're applying two rems of margin all the way around the section and setting the inner content to line up in a row by setting its display to flex. The gap property will just add some spacing in between the two buttons and is a handy way of ensuring every element in the button section has spacing because you might want to add more sharing links later on. The buttons themselves require quite a few properties. This will add some padding on the left and right of two rems and one rem on the top and bottom. We're also removing the border and outline of the button and setting the buttons themselves to be flex containers as we have added the icons to them and we want to make sure they line up nicely. Finally, we're making sure the buttons have a clickable cursor when the user hovers over them and making the font nice and bold and increasing its font size to 1.25 rems. There's a couple of specific rules to give each button we have a background color. Surprisingly, the deep sky blue actually matches the Twitter blue color quite nicely. All right, that's enough on the styling side of things for the moment. There are a couple of other things we need to come back to later on, but they'll become more obvious once we've got our JavaScript set up and working. Let's move on to getting our JavaScript to fetch a random quote for our app. You might be tempted at this point to set up an array of quotes and then get one of these at random and update the markup we just created, all in one function, or even worse in the global scope of our JavaScript file, but hold up just one second. A better way is to use several functions to get our random quote data, update our user interface and set up our sharing buttons, and really functions should be short and ideally only do one thing. We also need to keep track of the HTML elements on our page as well as the quote data itself, so a good solution here would be to capture all of these functions and bits of data in a JavaScript class. So our first step would be to create a JavaScript class and define what happens when we create a new object from it. The constructor function here will run when we create an object from our class with the new keyword, and as you can see, we're just grabbing a reference to all the elements we created in our markup earlier on. Rather than creating individual member or class variables for each of the quote elements like this.quote element, this.author element, and this.source element, we've set up an object on the class this.quote elements, which contains all of the references to the bits of the quote. 
With our constructor defined, we can create a new quote app object. To get our head around how this object will update our page, we're going to run through an example of getting a random quote before looking at adding the multiple data sources. We'll get our first random quote from a third-party API that provides a selection of generic quotes. The API endpoint is found at type.fit forward slash API forward slash quotes, so we're going to need to send a network request to this URL and then get the result as JSON data. Let's add a new function to our quote app class that fetches the result and returns the quote data. We've made the get random quote function async so we can use the await keyword to fetch our data. Because we actually get an array of quotes back as the result from the API, we need to pick a random one with the math.random function. Our function returns an object that has three properties, quote, the actual text of the quote, author, who said the quote, and source, where the quote was retrieved from. Choosing the names of these properties is important as when we add multiple data sources, we might need to deal with inconsistencies in the returned object property names. In other words, we might need to change or map the properties of the quotes returned from the API into the standard set we've defined. More on that shortly. Next, we need to update the user interface with these details and we'll create another function to do that. The function we'll create is called update page with quote and it first of all uses our previous get random quote function to get the quote details and then we extract the properties of the returned object, setting the author property to unknown if it doesn't have a value. Then it's just a simple case of updating the HTML elements with the respective values retrieved. Of course, this function isn't being called anywhere, so we should make sure it's called when the user clicks the new quote button. We'll set up a couple of event listeners in the constructor for our quote object to do this. For the new quote button, we'll add a click event listener that calls the update page with quote function when the user clicks this button. Because we're referencing other parts of the class inside the function, we need to preserve the this context by making sure we bind it to the function. The other event listener does exactly the same thing, but we'll call this when the page has loaded, so we'll see a new quote every time the page is loaded or refreshed. If we click the button a few times, you should find that we get a random quote each time from the TypeFit API, and we can see the quote text and the author being displayed. The source is remaining static as we've hard-coded this in the getRandomQuote function. So we could just leave it there, we've got a random quote generator working, but the point of this tutorial really was to make a next level JavaScript quote generator, and there's plenty more we can do with our project. The next thing on our list was to work with multiple data sources, so let's move on to that. So working with multiple data sources presents us with several challenges, such as working with different methods of fetching the data and keeping the data in the same format as the app requires. We're going to start off by breaking out the code we had to fetch our random quote into a separate file, which we're going to refer to as a data source. So in our data source file, we're just creating an object which we'll import into our quote app file in a moment. The object has two properties, name and get quote, which is a function which is pretty much the same code as we had in the get random quote function a moment ago. Notice that from this get quote function, we're returning two specific properties, quote and author. We need to keep these consistent across the data sources we're creating so the app doesn't have to guess where the quote text and author values are. Because we don't have transpilation or compilation set up with our project, we can't export or import these objects across our files. So in our HTML file, let's add a reference to the data source file we just created. Then we can add this to our quote app class. We'll add it in the constructor under a new member variable of data sources because in just a moment we'll be adding more of these. Now in our getRandomQuote function we can use this data source object to retrieve a random quote. The object we return from this function now is exactly the same as what we had before, but we've moved the logic of how to retrieve the quote into the data source file, and we just assumed that the data source object has a getQuote function which knows how to get a random quote for that particular source. That means to add more data sources, we just create more of these data source files and give them a get quote function. Let's add another source for someone who's rather well known for various different reasons. For this data source, the result from the network call is slightly different from the type fit data source we previously set up. Instead of returning an array of quotes, simply one result is returned. And although there are other properties in the resulting object, we only need to get the message property. This is mapped, so when we return an object from this data source's getQuote function, we're still returning an object that has a quote and an author property, and of course, because all the quotes have come from one author, we can hard code this value. We need to add this data source to our HTML file so it's available in the rest of our JavaScript, and then we can add it to the data source's member variable in our quote app class. Our getRandomQuote function is only looking at the first data source in our array at the moment, so let's create a function to get a random data source. 
and then in our get random quote function, we can get a random data source each time. And because each data source has a get quote function that returns an object with a quote and author property, we'll always get the data the app needs in the required format. If we click the new quote button a few times, we should see that the quotes are being retrieved and displayed from the two different data sources now. Of course, we're not restricted to using data sources that fetch data from an API. We could come up with our own that have different ways of generating a quote. For example, we could create an array of hard-coded quotes in our JavaScript and return one of those from a data source. You can see that this data source is not like the other two we've previously created. It doesn't make any network requests, it simply picks a random item from the array and returns it via a promise. We need to use a JavaScript promise here because the other data sources rely on it for their network requests. And it's simpler to make sure all the data sources have the same format rather than trying to deal with some synchronous and some asynchronous sources. The only other thing we need to do is add this source to our HTML file and update our data sources property one more time. We shouldn't need to do anything else with our quote app class as we've set it up now to look for random data sources already. Clicking the new quote button a few times shows that all three data sources are now being used. So now you know how to configure our quote app with unique data sources, you can go ahead and add as many as you like. There's another piece of functionality we've missed out, and that is the ability to share the quote via a tweet. Once we know the quote text, author and data source inside our update page with quote function, we can store this as a string inside a member variable of our class. If we use a template literal like this, we can preserve all the line breaks which will help with the formatting when we share it. Then if we create a new function on our class that opens the Twitter sharing URL with the text we just stored in the quote for sharing variable, we can run this when the user clicks the tweet button within the user interface. Inside our quote app constructor, let's add the event listener for this. Now when the user clicks the tweet button on our web page, the text that we stored in the template literal is used to open the Twitter sharing URL and we can then post this to Twitter if it's a particularly good quote. Of course we can add as many other sharing buttons as we like, it's just a case of getting the sharing URL or required call for the extra providers and then passing the quote for sharing text value we have stored. Just as a little nice to have, we can update the background colour of our page every time a new quote is generated. A quick way to do this is to create a CSS variable that we can then update in our JavaScript code. We'll also create a variable to say how long the transition should be. We'll use this variable in our body tag to set the background colour. Back in our JavaScript, we'll create a few functions to handle the random colour generation, and then we'll use the generated value to update the CSS variable. First, we'll create a function to get a random number between 0 and 255, and another to generate three of these numbers, assigning them to an object with the properties of R, G, and B. And finally, a function that updates the actual CSS variable with the generated RGB values. Then we can make a call to the setRandomBackgroundColor function when we're updating the user interface with a freshly retrieved quote. It would be quite nice to add a bit of a transition to the text when a new quote is generated too, so let's add a CSS class to indicate when a quote is being retrieved. All this does really is set the text colour of all the text inside the quote display section to be the same as the background colour, so when we add this loading class the text will disappear and it will reappear when we remove the class. Of course we want the text to fade in and out, so let's add a transition to the colour property of the quote display section. Then in our JavaScript we want to add this class to the quote section when we're updating the page so the text fades out. And remove it once the page has been updated and the new quote has been loaded. But if you do this you'll notice that the fade effect isn't working and that's because we're not giving the DOM enough time to update and apply the CSS transition when adding the class because we then pretty much remove the class straight away. One way around this is to set a timeout, so we wait a few milliseconds before updating the quote details and removing the loading class. You should find now that our text is fading in and out when we click the new quote button on the page. This fade effect helps to indicate to the user that they've actually clicked the button and a new quote is being fetched, but we should probably stop them from being able to click the button to prevent them spamming the app with the requests for new quotes. We'll do this by disabling the new quote button once it's been clicked, so it can't be clicked again until the new quote has finished loading. The first step to disabling the button is to set the disabled attribute on the new button element. This should stop the user from being able to click the button again whilst the random quote is being fetched, but of course we need to re-enable the button so they can get more random quotes. So let's remove the disabled attribute once we know the quote has been updated on the page. We should probably add a CSS rule to the button when it's disabled to indicate to the user that the button is not broken and it's just temporarily disabled. The sea green colour should just darken the overall button, 
indicating that it's disabled. Now when the user gets a new quote, there is a temporary disabled state applied to the new quote button so it can't be accidentally or intentionally clicked many times in quick succession. So we've caught one particular problem with our quote app, but what if something goes wrong with one of the data sources? Perhaps it goes offline or it returns some bad data. We said at the start of the tutorial that we would provide a fallback if there are any problems getting a quote from one of the data sources. So let's move on to dealing with errors in the app. If there are any problems with a data source, let's default to using the data source with the hard-coded array of quotes. We know that that will always work as the quotes will already be in the browser ready to read. The first change we'll make to achieve this is to pass an optional argument to the getRandomQuote function. The argument is one of our data sources, and if this is provided, we'll use this as the data source for our lookup rather than getting a random one. Then in our update page with quote function, we'll look out for any errors when we try and get a random quote and catch them. So anything bad that happens inside the getRandomQuote function will cause the catch block to set the random quote result variable to the result of a random quote from the array data source. You can see that updating the getRandomQuote function with the optional argument is really useful as we can subtly change how it works for different scenarios. We can simulate a problem with our data sources that rely on the third party APIs by just setting ourselves to offline inside of the Chrome DevTools. As soon as the network connection isn't available, those data sources that rely on the APIs won't be able to connect and we'll get an error triggering our fallback. So we should find now we're only getting quotes coming back from the internal app array data source, making sure our users always get some sort of quote, no matter the state of the other data sources. It's nice to have these third party APIs to get random quotes for us, but what about if we wanted to create our own API to serve data? How would we go about doing that? Well that's exactly what we'll be doing in the next tutorial so make sure you check that out when you're ready to learn about setting up your own API and using it with your own front-end applications. But that's it for this tutorial, thanks very much for watching, I'll see you next time.